And the coolest part was I saw him maybe two or three months later, I was still working at the same hospital and he walked into outpatient therapy and he just walked on in. He's just like, welcome back to another episode from the Optimal Body Podcast. I'm Doc Jen. And I'm Dr. Dom. And today we're going to talk about why is it so important to understand how mindset plays a role when it comes to pain? Does it really matter? Let's dive into some research. Now, before we dive into some research and even our own take on how we use mindset and pain when it comes to our own bodies or our own patients, you know, we really want to make sure that you don't miss out on future episodes because we talk more about like specific diagnoses or we even have episodes and and videos just on exercise. So what exercises can you do for certain pains? So please, please, if you haven't yet hit that subscribe, comment below if you have any questions about this episode or you have questions about future episodes you want us to cover. We need to hear from you. The physical body, the pain that we feel, it doesn't just have to do with the physical body. It's so integrated into our mindset, into socially what we're doing in our world. And so I'm excited to kind of talk about how we have worked with patients or even within our own bodies, how we understand this or how we work with somebody who has persisting pains and how we use mindset tools to be able to help them out with that. And some things that we just found in research that continues to show over and over and over again, how important having a positive mindset is. This is so prevalent in what we embody on Gen Health and through our programs and everything because in every single challenge I've done since the very beginning, since they were only five to seven days, I have always put mindset tools, whether it is a weekly email that you're getting about a mindset tool or whatever it is, like mindset tools have always been a part of my challenges because it is not just about movement. And I'm so glad that we have some research as well to help back up what and why this is so important. When we started reading through some of the research that our lovely teammate, (laughs) Ceci, put together for us, it it just continued to help showing. I mean, they they start developing all these models like the fear avoidance model or a shared vulnerability model. Mm -hmm. And, And the common theme throughout is that people who have or show higher levels of pain tend to show higher levels of not being able to find these positive values in their life, not being able to focus on the positive things and only kind of catastrophizing. And we consistently see this positive correlation between catastrophization Mm -hmm. or fear surrounding movement and higher levels of pain. Pain hits, your first thing is I need to stop. Like your brain is literally telling you something's wrong. I need to protect you. Stop doing that thing. That's why yeah. it's it's signaling pain in the first place. It's stop. Oh no, something's wrong. And so our, our brain is naturally here to protect us. And it is natural to have that kind of avoidance of that exercise you were doing or that movement or that activity, whatever it may be. However, if we continue to avoid it and we continue to say, that activity is what caused my pain and this is why it's bad and you know we just catastrophize it we just know that that pain is only going to continue and we're not going to really be able to work through it if we continue to avoid it and we literally see from research you know how it points out that the pain pathways in your central nervous system are tightly linked and connected with our emotions sensitized by both early painful or traumatic experience as well as a painful stimulation that you might feel from Um, like a tissue injury. So that all gets stored within our nervous system. and, And we kind of remember that they go into, you know, talking about anxiety sensitivity, kind of yeah, causing a little bit more disability and pain, fear causing more disability and pain. And we just see these continued correlations throughout the research of yeah. of how our emotions play a role with us continuing to feel pain. And that's kind of in that model of shared vulnerability. I yeah. mentioned that at the beginning where like, if we are vulnerable in one of those aspects, if our fear is taking over, mm-hmm. if our anxiety is taking over, it gives our overall system less buffer before we start to feel yeah. pain. It's kind of the example, we, we interviewed a guy who talked about a cup of water. You know, normally mm-hmm. you start with your cup empty for the day. And then every little stress that hits you, you dump a little bit in. But if we are very anxious about something, or if we have a lot of fears about something, we're starting with our cup 80% full, Mm -hmm. 75% full, already overflowing. And that means that we have so much less buffer and our nervous system is so much more vulnerable to feeling pain 
more quickly. They propose that stress intolerance and pain hypersensitivity syndromes result from chronically overburdened stress response system that shifts from that hyper to hypoactivity, causing reduced effort tolerance and altered inflammatory activity with increased sensitization. So if you can literally impact your inflammation based on your stress response, this is where it becomes so incredibly important. Once I feel the pain or once something happens, how am I responding to it? For when we start talking about therapies that have been very effective for pain, you know, if we talk about cognitive behavioral therapies mm -hmm. or starting to identify some of the behaviors that may be perpetuating or adding to these pain patterns that we're developing, acceptance commitment therapy, which is funny because my therapist actually recommended I get the acceptance commitment therapy book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's something that I'm reading right now. So it's kind of fun. And there was one example in there. It's called like a riding the bus example where that fear, if, if that's a person on your bus, they're always there. Like the fear doesn't completely go away. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a really hard thing to remove from our conscious or our subconscious. So they're always riding the bus, but are you going to let them sit right behind the driver mm. and yell at the driver? and say, you need to turn here, you need to do this. Or are you gonna say, excuse me, sir, you're being disruptive. I need you to move back. Mm -hmm. And that's some that's a tool that I use with myself in anxious situations where it's just like, move back. Yeah. I'm, I'm driving the bus, yeah. you know? And there's just other like mindful stress reduction techniques, yep. all of which have been shown to be really effective in helping people address pain. Yeah, especially when it comes to mindfulness, that's where we talk about vagal tone now. You know, and, yeah. and even how we're approaching ourselves or the environment we're putting ourselves in when it comes to pain. So if you are maybe going to a clinic that's like really high energy or your therapist is like over there, da, 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 like yelling, that can cause a stressful environment as well. Like you want to make sure that you're with a therapist if you are working through something physical, you know, physical therapy that is able to calmly talk to you and use a tone of voice that even changes the response to how your pain is is going to feel like this is all super important, you know, and we can change our vagal response based on our breath, just like Dom was talking about before, yeah. you know, am I going to start breathe slower? Am I going to just inhale, exhale through my nose? That all changes our response within our body. And then they did talk about, you know, positive affect that has such a correlation with how we're responding to this pain as well. So when we're talking about positive affect, we can think of this like capitalizing on a positive effect, feeling gratitude, cultivating mindfulness, positive reappraisal, focusing on personal strengths rather than what you're not being able to do. And yeah. this is something I love, love doing and then engaging in like acts of kindness even. So what are we doing on those like little day to day basis that can make an impact? Even if you feel like, well, me saying gratitude <laughs> has nothing to do with my pain, but it does. It yeah. automatically shifts your perspective of what we're focusing on. And even the distraction of pain helps to reduce pain. And these aren't easy things, especially no. if you're somebody that is experiencing pain and is having pain on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. It's not easy to just say like, okay, I'm going to suddenly start to be grateful for things. But think about when you wake up and sit up to the edge of your bed. Do you want the first thing you say to be, oh my gosh, my back's in so much pain. Like I just, I, this is an awful way to start the day. Think about where that's starting your nervous system. Yep. Are you adding a lot of water to that cup versus sitting up to the edge of the bed? Maybe the pain's there, but to be able to say, man, I'm so grateful to wake up and to be able to sit up to the edge of the bed today. Yeah. Or even if you can't even relate it to your pain right away, like what else could you be grateful for in the day? Even yeah. just focusing away from your body for a moment and focusing on other gratitude. So I'm grateful that I have a husband that's downstairs making me a smoothie because that's what I got today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like how can we focus on other things even that start to create and and again distract yourself from pain what can i do for someone else today that's not necessarily focusing on myself or focusing on my pain those are all examples of how we start to distract from this thinking about the pain thinking about what i can't do thinking about what's wrong right and and just focusing on what's what's going on in the world and what what can i do to make a positive effect 
just outside of what I feel in my body. And another positive thing and, and great thing you can do right in the morning is imagery. You know, mm -hmm. there's some research that's showing that imagery can be correlative or it seems promising to be able to help induce an analgesic effect or a pain relieving effect where even if you wake up and you're laying in bed and you're talking through some gratitude, do some imagery for the day. Say, you know, I'm so excited to get up and go downstairs and make an incredible breakfast for myself before heading off to work. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited to go and greet my kid and wake them up and love them up and get them ready for school before I drive them in or whatever it might be. Any, any of that positive imagery because Again, think about the messages that that's going to be typing into the nervous system. It's going to start acting like a disruption to that pain pattern. And so rather than typing more messages into the pain pattern, we're starting to write a different code. We know from research that worrying about pain is associated with higher pain levels. Well, then let's just fake being positive about it. <laughs> let's just pretend for a moment that I'm gonna say, you know, this is great, this is okay. I'm breathing, I can still move, I'm still going to work, I'm still playing with my kid. Yes, it hurts, right? Yes, yeah. we're not saying that it doesn't, but we're going to pretend for a moment, I'm gonna be positive about it, even if you have to fake it. I mean, it's kind of like if you've heard anyone talk about confidence and kind of faking that you're in a room and feeling really confident when inside you're like, oh my God, I don't wanna to talk to anyone. But yeah. you kind of have to fake it at first in order to start to get your nervous system used to something different. And eventually it's gonna to start to become a little bit more habit. Because again, if we know that worrying about pain is only gonna increase pain, let's try try your best. Language is everything. And when I saw a lot of patients, language was everything that I worked on with them. Yeah. How you talk about your body dictates what you're saying, the response that you're giving yourself, and if you're catastrophizing it, if you're worrying more, if what kind of affect you're, you're having towards your pain. So how someone would talk about their pain was so incredibly important to me. I wanna know, are you saying, my back is breaking, <laughs> my knee is exploding. Think about these messages that we're telling our brain when we say those kinds of things. Yeah. You know, rather than my, oh my gosh, my back, it talks to me in the morning a bit, but you know, I can still get up, I can still move. I've learned this breath technique that helps to lower it a, t a, a tiny bit so I can still go about my day. Whatever that may be, we have to be so mindful of the language we're using toward our pain. Like that reminds me of a patient too who was told, she was like in her 30s, and she was told she can't ride her bike anymore because that would be too much flexion in her, her spine. Knee. Oh, on her spine. On her spine. And I'm like, let's think about this for a minute. Like, do you know other people that you've seen bike ride around who are much older? And she's like, yeah, actually I have. And I'm like, okay, well, that's possible then. It's possible to be older, possibly have some degeneration of your spine and still be able to do the activity that you want to do. Yeah. So how do we get back to there? And I think that's what's continuing to remind yourself like, it might look a little different right now, but it's possible. If I can see someone else who, and we've gone over so much research in other podcasts of people who have disc herniations and are still able to do the activities or have no pain at all, yeah. right? So if that is possible for one person, why can't it be possible for me? Say one of my favorite patient experiences that I've ever had <laughs> was with this gentleman who got in a snowmobile accident and he had multiple, I think close to a dozen fractures in his pelvis, had one of his collarbones that was complete clean fracture, and he was in tons of pain. And when I walked into the room, the occupational therapist was walking out, kind of like throwing hands up in the air, like, good luck, <laughs> you know? But all the nurses, the doctors kept telling him, the only way we're gonna be able to get your pain to come down at all is using pain medications. Mm -hmm. It's giving you some opioids or some morphine. This individual had a previous heroin addiction, and he's like, I am not going to let you put any opioids in my system right now. I have been clean and sober from heroin for however many years, like no. <laughs> I just kind of sat next to him and this was pretty early on when I was starting to use breath work with patients. Mm -hmm. I said, let's try something. Might not be the most comfortable thing in the world, but he wasn't even able to roll over in bed at this point. Couldn't even roll in bed because he was in so much pain. I said, we're gonna breathe. We're gonna breathe for like two, three, four minutes. And at the end of that session, you're gonna keep breathing and I'm gonna have you roll and sit to the side of the bed. And he did it and he rolled and sat to the side of the bed and was in a little bit of discomfort, but he's just like, oh my gosh, the pain is so much lower than it was when I was just sitting there writhing. And I'm like, okay, you wanna get back? He's just like, let's stand up. <laughs> I said, all right, let's try standing up. Stands up with me again in a little bit of discomfort. 
but I could just see his face lighting up like this is possible. He even tried to do some like shuffling steps <laughs> at the side of the bed, laid back down, and I saw him a couple other times while he was in the hospital and he just said, been doing that breath stuff every day. You know, it's, it's awesome. And the coolest part was I saw him maybe two or three months later, I was still working at the same hospital and he walked into outpatient therapy and he just walked on in. He's just like, man, I've been doing that breath stuff like every day. Like, I feel like I just have a new lease on being able to take control of pains and stuff like that. It was just like the gratitude that he had for having a tool mm -hmm. to address or just touch on his pain other than what everyone else was telling him. Oh, pain medication is the only way. That was pretty powerful. And that was pretty powerful for me too, to be able to see that. Whether we get in an accident or whether we get in a stressful event or whether we're not sleeping very much, pain is going to happen in our lives. And it's actually something necessary that our system has to be able to alert us of. It's a good thing. If we don't feel pain, we don't know when we step on something sharp. There's so many more negative effects that happen if we don't experience pain. So pain is actually an amazing, incredible alarm system, but it's just information for change. Something in our life needs to change, whether that's physical, emotional, or, you know, environmental. And that's something that, you know, going through pregnancy for my first time, I've been able to experience now myself. And if I'm kind of slumped and relaxing on the couch for a little bit, and then I get up all of a sudden, that first initial step, I feel a zing of pain usually into my pubic symphysis area. But I also know, oh, this is a new sensation for my body because I've never had this much mobility at my pelvis due to the relaxing and increased hormones. So this is, my brain is suspecting something new. And the moment I do that, the moment I take a couple more steps, no more pain because I know yeah. my body has the stability. I know my body is strong. I know my body has the support. And this is just a new sensation, not necessarily a pain. So I talk about the sensations I feel in my body rather than the pains that I feel in my body. And it creates a whole new experience. And I'm able to go through this pregnancy, still lifting, still doing mobility, still feeling great. So I think language is so incredibly powerful and our mindset play is, is everything when it comes to pain. Thanks for joining us for another podcast all about how our mindset and being positive and optimistic about our pain situation can really, really make an impact. Did you learn anything? Are you having pain? Are you using any tools similar to what we talked about or different than what we talked about? Please comment below and don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can always be there for the new videos we come out with.